G'day, this is Chris Savage from Our Real Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Book of Jeremiah. I pray that it will be a blessing to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. So welcome back to this session of Jeremiah. We're into session seven. We're going from chapter eight, verse four to chapter 10, verse five. We will go straight into it. Now, uh, we're looking now at a set in a, in a section called the backsliding people and their ruin. And this goes from chapter eight, verse four to chapter nine, verse 22. Now, after Jeremiah condemned the false usage of the temple back in chapter seven, uh, one to eight, three, he now speaks about uh, Judah's backslidden people and their doom, which is coming. So as I said, this goes from eight, four to nine, 22. Judah is now going to face a judgment described back in chapter seven, verse 32 to 30. Uh, 32 to 83, which we, we finished off last session, because the people have purposely adhered to their sins and they were unwilling to change. Even with the prophet speaking to them, they were still unwilling to change with the prophet Jeremiah speaking to them and, and with the prophet Ezekiel in sometimes. Now, this section will be broken down into seven points. We're going to look at the, the continuation of the backsliding from verses four to seven of chapter eight, rejection of the law of Moses in chapter eight. 8 to 12, the horror of the coming doom in uh, verses 13 to 17. Uh, we're going to see <clears throat> the description of Jeremiah as a weeping prophet in verse 18 to chapter 9, verse 1. The revulsion of Israel's corruption in verse 2 to 9, the fall of the city, 10 to 16, and the call to lament in verses 17 to 22. Now, incidentally, uh, not incidentally, but fact, uh, Jeremiah 8, Verse 13 to 9, verse 22 is part of a prayer uh, that the Jewish people recite on uh, Tishabav, Tisha uh, which is an annual fast day in, in Judaism that commemorates a number of disasters that affected Jews for years to come, in, like the temple disasters and, and, and the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, it's a prayer concerning the destruction of Jerusalem. So we're going to look at the backsliding people and their ruin. Yeah, and we're looking at a continuation here of their backsliding in verses four to seven of chapter eight. I'm just going to read chapter uh, uh, verses four to six first. Moreover, you shall say unto them, Thus says Jehovah, Shall men fall and not rise up again? Shall one turn away and not return? Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit, they refuse to return. Verse six. I hearkened and heard, but they spoke not aright. No man repents him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turns to his course as a horse that rushes headlong into battle. So in verse 4, the point here is that Judah's backsliding is unnatural. If one falls, one naturally gets up after he falls. One naturally returns home after going out for the day. They're things of nature, they're natural things. However, in verse 5, Judah doesn't behave naturally because her backslidings are perpetual. She just keeps on keeping on. Twice he uses his favorite root, which is that word shuv, remember, S-H-U-V, for backsliding. They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. This is the third time that the word shuv is used. Now, as God and Jeremiah observed the situation in verse 6, they observed that there is no repenting on behalf of Judah. Everyone seems to hurry headlong to his own destruction. Everyone turns to his own course. And again, we see the word shuv being used here, S-H-U-V. Verse 7, yes. The stork in the heavens knows her appointed times, and the turtle dove and the swallow and the crane observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the law of Jehovah. So in verse 7, again, we see even nature observes natural law, but Israel doesn't. The stork, the swallow, the birds, and the crane, they observe the times of their migration. They know when it happens, and they just do it. The point here is that even tiny little bird brains know. But what about Israel? My people do not know the law of Jehovah. That which should have become natural to them has become 
unnatural. In verses 8 to 12, we now see the rejection of the law of Moses. And in these verses, he elaborates upon the last point of verse 7. Not only did they not know the law, but they also rejected the law. How do you say we are wise and the law of Jehovah is with us? But behold, the false pen of the scribes has wrought falsely. The wise men are put to shame. They're dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of Jehovah. And what manner of wisdom is in them? So in verse 8, in spite of what verse 7 said, they claim to uphold the law. How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? They have taken the law and turned it into a lie. And, and the means by which they did this was by means of the scribes. So even in the Old Testament times, the scribes were guilty of changing the meaning of the law. And that was not just a New Testament problem of the scribes. This problem is found as early as here in Jeremiah. The scribes are guilty of producing false expositions of the law. They permit that which is forbidden, and they forbid that which is permitted. And this happened as early as Jeremiah. But these scriptures here confirm this as a very unfavorable description. In reality, in verse 9, those who claim to be wise are actually put to shame. They're dismayed because they've actually rejected the word of Jehovah. Now, the question is asked rhetorically, so what wisdom do they have? Because they have disobeyed and rejected the law as it is, and they've accepted the law only at as it has been changed by the scribes, now they will be possessed by others. Their possessions will also be possessed by others. And verse 9 shows the reality. The wise men are put to shame. They are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of Jehovah. And what manner of wisdom is in them? Claiming to uphold the law, the wise men actually rejected the will of Jehovah and had been caught in the act. Therefore, they're going to be put to shame. And the question in this verse is, what kind of wisdom did they have? They had none. They weren't wise at all. Because they have disobeyed and rejected the law of Moses as it actually is written, and accepted the law only as now it has been changed by the scribes, now they'll be possessed by others. And this, the first part of verse 10 declares that this people would be possessed by others. Therefore, will I give their wives unto others and their fields to them that shall possess them. So it is God himself. He made sure that the wives as well as the fields of these men would now be given to others. Second part of verse 10 and the, down to the first part of verse 12, four reasons are now given for this judgment. First reason for the judgment of being possessed by others First, first, uh, second part of verse 10, for everyone from the least even unto the greatest is given to covetousness. What that means is everybody was greedy for gain. And second, without exception, from the prophet even unto the priest, everyone deals falsely. The religious leadership of Israel actually practiced deceit. And third in verse 11, their false prophecies led to a false security. And they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. While they cried, peace, peace, when there is no peace. So the reality here was that Jehovah had not prophesied peace for his people. The false prophets were. And then fourth, in the first part of verse 12, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Judah had been caught in an abominable, in abominable worship and was not even ashamed. They, they didn't even raise a blush. It was nothing to them. It was just normal. And then verse 12 continues on. And it shows that for all these reasons, judgment would come. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall. In the time of their visitation, they shall be cast down, says Jehovah. 
Now, the word visitation here actually means to be visited in judgment. And that judgment will be that they will be cast down. Now, well, we, just in, in the introduction, we spoke about uh, this segment of Jeremiah 8, 4 to 9, 22, the, the prayer that the Jewish people recite in uh, Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, begins here in verse 13. Now, this is the horror of the coming doom, verses 13 to 17. This verse, verse 17, reveals the utter destruction. I will utterly consume them, says Jehovah. There shall be no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree, and the leaf shall fade. Back in chapter 2, verse 21, uh, Jeremiah compared Israel to a choice vine, which became degenerate. And then in, in chapter 6, verse 9, this same vine was gleaned. Now, in chapter 8, verse 13, it is completely fruitless. So the divine destruction had taken its course, and the devastation was now complete. Notice that the fig tree also is described as bearing no fruit, nothing at all. And the things that I have given them shall pass away from them. So God also now declared that the material blessings he had promised to give to the Israelites, if they obeyed the Mosaic law, would now be taken away from them. And then verses 14 to 15, when it's already too late, the people realize something's wrong. Hang on. Something's gone wrong here. Why do we sit still? Verse 14. Why do we sit still? Assemble yourselves. Let us enter into the fortified cities and let us be silent there. For Jehovah our God has put us to silence and given us water of gold to drink because we have sinned against Jehovah. We looked for peace, but no good came. And for a time of healing and behold, dismay. Here we have Jeremiah quoting the people, but it has already reached the point where it is too late. Point of no return has been reached. In verse 14 is their search for security. Why are we going to sit still? Let's get into the fortified cities. Let us keep quiet there. Why? Because Jehovah, our God, has put us to silence and he's given us water of gold to drink. Now, by giving uh, us bitter waters to drink, the phrase uh, a bitter water to drink or water of gall uh, literally means it's the water of the poisonous plant. So the people now realize the reason is because they have sinned against Jehovah. And by the time they realize all this, it's too late. Judgment is now struck. In verse 15 is the voice of disappointment concerning what they had believed back in verse 11. We looked for peace, but no good came. And for a time of healing, and there was dismay. The promises of the false prophets provided, sorry, proved false indeed. But now when they finally learn this, it is too late. As verse 16 shows, the invasion had begun in earnest. The snorting of his horses is heard from Dan. At the sound of the neighing of his strong ones, the whole land trembles, for they are come and have devoured the land and all that is in it the city and those that dwell therein. The city of Dan was located on the northernmost border of Israel. So the enemy has entered through Dan. The enemy has entered the northern boundaries of the land with his strong ones, his military forces, the entire land trembles. Again, what this is, this is a picture of invasion from the north, but we don't have any specific name yet. It's just coming from the north. But the description of this invasion focuses on the massiveness of this army. The land trembles underfoot. Now, Dan had received a very special blessing when his father Jacob said to him back in Genesis 49, 17, Dan shall be a serpent in the way, an adder in the path that bites the horse's heels so that his rider falls backwards. Now, remember that there. Dan became one of the most courageous of the 12 tribes and actually was chosen to serve as Israel's rear guard through the wilderness wanderings. They were the last tribe in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the group. Yet when the Babylonians invaded the land, Dan's strength failed and it could not protect Israel from the enemy. In verse 17, the judgment is now inescapable. 
For behold, I will send serpents, adders among you, which will not be charmed, and they shall bite you, says Jehovah. Notice what Dan was. He shall be a serpent in the way, an adder in the path. And now, the resemblance to this, of this verse, the blessings of Dan, don't miss it. Dan was to be a serpent in the way and an adder in the path whose bites would surely take out the strongest enemy. However, now God was sending serpents and adders that would turn against his own people. The picture here is that God is sending these serpents and adders who will not be charmed, but they're going to bite. And the chapter ends with one of the reasons why Jeremiah has been called the weeping prophet. In verses 18 to chapter 9, verse 1. In verse 18, Oh, that I could comfort myself against sorrow. My heart is faint within me. As Jeremiah saw in his visions how his people were going to be destroyed, the destruction that is to be devastated upon his nation, he is now beyond comfort. He is just beside himself. His heart faints within him. The sorrow is so great that it could easily kill him. It hurts even more in, the, in verse 19 because he can already hear Israel's cry for help. This is all is what he's seeing in his vision. Behold the voice, the cry of the daughter of my people from a land that is very far off. He hears it in a land very far off. Later, we're going to learn that that land is Babylon. Now, apparently in exile, the question they ask is, is not Jehovah in Zion? Is not her king in her? You know, this reflects back to the, to the thoughts of chapter 7, verse 4. Remember, the people thought that the temple and Jehovah dwelling in the temple would guarantee her security. But it didn't. Now, God's answer comes here as it did back in chapter 7, verse 4. Verse 19. Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and with foreign vanities? God's question answers Israel's two questions. Israel's two questions were, isn't the Lord in Zion? Isn't God, isn't Jerusalem's king in her? That's not the problem, though. The problem was not that Jehovah was not in Zion or that he had stopped being her king. The dire situation of the people was simply the result of their own actions. Had they not forsaken God for the worship of foreign idols, they would still be in the land. Now in verse 20, hope has passed. The harvest is past, the summer has ended, and we're not saved. This shows that the barley, the wheat, and the fruit harvests would all fail. In verse 21, Jeremiah suffers vicariously for his people. For the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. I mourn. Dismay has taken hold of me. Although his prophecies have not yet taken place, Jeremiah knows that they will be fulfilled because God has spoken it. Verse 22 says, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Verse 22 is a very famous verse. In, in fact, it was turned into a, a Christian hymn called the balm of Gilead. Is there no balm in Gilead? The balm in, in Gilead was a resin or a balsam that was used for medicinal purposes as an ointment. Um, in fact, uh, Jeremiah 46.11 and Jeremiah 51.8 uh, speak about this. Now, Gilead was the main producer of this ointment. In fact, the group of people that took Joseph to Egypt was carrying balm from Gilead in Genesis 37, verse 25. Genesis 37, verse 25. Now, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Or, or what? It, literally what it says here, why has not new skin grown over the wound? That's what the question is. Second Chronicles chapter 36, verses 14 to 16, states that the sickness, this wound, this sickness, had reached a fatal level for which there was no cure, incurable. His weeping reaches a certain level in chapter 9, verse 1. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. 
Jeremiah wants more water. So intense was Jeremiah's grief that he wished his head and his eyes would turn into bottomless sources of tears. And this would allow him to express his sorrow on a continuous basis. He wishes that his eyes were a great fountain so he could continue to weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of his people. This is why he's the weeping prophet. Now, we see in verses in chapter 9, verses 2 to 9, uh, there's now an expression of, uh, of revulsion for Israel's corruption. We'll read, uh, we'll read this section, verse 2 to 9, chapter 9. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayf wayfaring men, that I might leave my people and go from them. For they are all adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men, and they bend their tongue, as it were, their bow for falsehood. And they are grown strong in the land, but not for truth, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, says Jehovah. Take ye heed every one of his neighbor, and trust you not in any brother, for every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will go about with slanders. Verse 5. And they will deceive everyone his neighbor and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They weary themselves to commit iniquity. Your habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit, they refuse to know me, says Jehovah. Therefore, thus says Jehovah of hosts, behold, I will melt them and try them. For how else should I do because of the daughter of my people? Their tongue is a deadly arrow. It speaks deceit. One speaks peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in his heart he lays wait for him. Shall I not visit them for these things, says Jehovah? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? Now, in the earlier segment, uh, uh, chapter 8, verses 18 to 9, 1, Jeremiah expressed on one side deep sorrow for the judgment which is about to fall upon his people. The sorrow was so great that it could easily destroy him. But in this segment, Jeremiah expresses revulsion at what he sees. He knows that what he sees will bring in the judgment at which he wept earlier. In verse 2, he expressed a desire for separation. Oh, that I had a, in the wilderness a lodging place for wayfaring men. He desired a place far away so that all he would be confronted with were people who were passing by for the night. Just an inn. And the purpose is that I might leave my people and go from them, for they are all adulterers and assembly of treacherous men. So as Jeremiah looks upon his people, he sees that they are all adulterous. They're an assembly of treacherous men. The word assembly here is normally used for religious purposes. So while they assemble for religious purposes, they exercise treachery as well. They bend their tongue as if it were they're both a falsehood. Now, and they're growing strong in the land, but not for truth. In verses three to six, he deals with the corruption. So what he says here, he says, they bend their tongue like it was a bow for falsehood. So they're characterized by lying and falsehood. They are strong in the land, but not for truth. The word truth here means faith. It means that there is no strong faith in the land. Instead, uh, they proceed from evil to evil because, because there is no faith in the land. The result is that they don't know the Lord. And then in verse 4, he says, no one is to be trusted. No one. You can't trust your neighbor. The neighbor is slandered. You can't trust your brother because the brother supplants. And here we have a bit of a play upon words on, on the brother supplants here. Uh, the Hebrew terms for utterly and supplant. Utterly is Akov, A-K-O-V, and supplant is Yaakov. And both come from the same root that means to follow at the heel. So what we have here, there's a play on the words in the phrase utterly supplant that can be rendered as he out Jacob, Jacob. He out Jacob, Jacob. In verse 5 to 6, we see that they're characterized by deceit. They've made it a common practice to see how far they could go in deceiving their neighbor. No one speaks the truth. In fact, they train their tongues to speak lies. They wear themselves out totally 
for the purpose of committing iniquity. And through all this deceit in which they live in the midst, they refuse to know the Lord. And for that reason, in verses 7 to 9, the judgment must now come. In this judgment in verse 7, there will be the melting of Judah. This melting judgment is necessary. Jerusalem will become a furnace of affliction. It's a figure used by other prophets as well. Isaiah uh, 1, verse 22 and 25 uses it. Isaiah 1, 22, 25. Ezekiel uh, 22, 17 to 22 uses it. Ezekiel 22, 17 to 22. Zechariah 13, 9. Zechariah 13, 9. And Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. Behold, I will melt them and try them. For how else shall I deal with the daughter of my people? So Judah is punished more severely than the other nations because of the unique relationship that she has with God. She's a covenant nation. As always, greater revelation carries with it greater responsibility. Greater responsibility carries with it greater judgment for failure. To whom much is given, much is required. Verse 8 now confirms what we bring on this melting judgment was actually consistent deceitfulness. They speak deceit. No one speaks peaceably to his neighbor, but in his heart, he always lays wait for him. So on one hand, the people were speaking nice messages of peace to their neighbors, but on the other hand, their hearts were actually already plotting some evil schemes against those, those very same neighbors. And because these actions of deceit were continuous, they made the judgment necessary. And in verse 9, for the third time, he uses words which emphasizes the necessity of judgment. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Again, we're going to see that he'll visit in the sense of judging. Shall not my soul be avenged in such a nation as this? Uh, again, see, he uses the word nation here. The word used here is goy, G-O-Y, because Judah had degenerated into a pagan, like a pagan Gentile nation. So for the third time, he uses the same word to emphasize what happened to Judah and the reasons and why he must judge this nation. In verses 10 to 16, he deals with Jerusalem's fall and coming exile. For the mountains will I take up a weeping and wailing. Oh, this is verse 10, chapter 9. And for the pastors of the wilderness, a lamentation, because they are burned up so that none passes through. Neither can men hear the voice of the cattle. Both the birds of the heavens and the beasts are fled. They're gone. And I'll make Jerusalem heaps, a dwelling place of jackals. And I'll make the cities of Judah a desolation without inhabitant. So here in verses 10 to 11, we have an expansion of lamentation over Jerusalem. Jeremiah specifically lamented three losses. First, the mountains and pasture lands, which will become bare and desolate. The land will be burned to such a degree that no one could pass through it anymore. Second, not even the sound of domesticated animals are heard anywhere. There were none left. And third, even the birds had disappeared. Now, as for Jerusalem itself, in verse 11, it has become heaps. This is a heap of ruins. It is a place where wild animals now dwell. The other cities of Judah had been destroyed everywhere. Now, with this picture of judgment and destruction concerning Judah, in verse 12, he issues a challenge to those who consider themselves wise. Who is the wise man that may understand this? And who is he to whom the mouth of the Lord has spoken that he may declare it? Can these false prophets, they're the wise, he's talking about here, can these false prophets explain the events that have taken place? There's no answer, for the wise men are ashamed. Go back to chapter 8, verse 9. They predicted the exact opposite of what took place. The parallel passage to this is Hosea 14, verse 9. Hosea 14, verse 9. Wherefore is the land perished and burned up like a wilderness, so that none passes through? So what happens here is that these pseudo-wise men or these false prophets are not able to answer or explain the events of verses 10 to 11. Verse 13, Jehovah saith, because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, 
and have not obeyed my voice, neither walked therein, but have walked after the stubbornness of their own heart and after the Baalim, which their fathers taught them. So in verses 13 to 14, God gives an answer and he says three things. First of all, the first reason is that they have forsaken the law of Moses. Secondly, they have walked after the stubbornness of their own evil hearts. And third, they worship the Baalim. It was an idolatrous worship, which they learned from their own fathers. For these three reasons, the devastation of verses 10 to 11 will take place. The false prophets were unable to list these three reasons, so God provided the answer for them. In verse 15 and 16, Therefore, thus says Jehovah of hosts, God of Israel, Behold, I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood and give them water of gold to drink. I will scatter them also among the nations whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send the sword after them till I have consumed them. Now, in verses 15 to 16, further judgments are given. First of all, he deals with the judgment which will take place while they are still in the land. There, verse 15, the God, therefore, thus says Jehovah of hosts, the God of Israel, I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood, give them water of gold to drink. Now, so while they're still in the land, there is going to be bitterness. There will be wormwood to drink and waters of gold. These are poisonous waters. The po this poisonous water was first mentioned back in, in chapter 8, verse 14. Second, bitterness in the land will be followed by dispersion out of the land. Verse 16, I will scatter them also among the nations whom neither they nor their fathers have known. Now, if that's not enough, they'll also suffer persecution among the nations in which they're scattered. So there's going to be a twofold judgment. First of all, while they're in the land, the bitterness will be their experience. And second, eventually they'll be scattered. Persecution is going to take place during their exile. And then he says, and I will send the sword after them till I have consumed them. Now, at this point in, in, in this prophecy, Jeremiah looked well beyond the Babylonian captivity to the greater judgment, which came only after AD 70. In AD 70, a worldwide dispersion took place, followed by persecution during that dispersion. And currently today, they're still in that dispersion. We have the call of the lamenting women in verses 17 to 22. And in light of the, the coming severity of judgment, there's a call for these professional uh, mourners to, to come and mourn. Thus said Jehovah of hosts, consider you and call for the mourning women that they may come and send for the skillful women that they may come and let them make haste and take up a wailing for us that our eyes may run down with tears and our eyelids gush out with waters. For a voice of wailing is heard out of Zion. How are we ruined? We are greatly confounded because we have forsaken the land, because they have cast down our dwellings. So in verse 17, we have the call goes out to the professional uh, guild of women who are usually hired to do the, the wailing and, and lead in mournful lamentation. They're, in verse 17, they're to call for these, these women. In verse 18, they're to quickly take up their mournful wailing. As some people are to lead in singing, these women are to lead in weeping. By means of their skillful mourning to cause people to weep, they must do so intensively. That our eyes may run down with tears and our eyelids gush out with water. Their very eyelids are to gush with water. The wailing song itself is given in verse 19. It is a death song of the people. For a voice of wailing is heard from Zion. How we are plundered. We're greatly confounded. The reason that they are ruined and confounded is because they have forsaken the land. They have gone into exile. The enemy has destroyed their homes. Verse 20 to 22. Yet hear the word of Jehovah. O ye women, let your ear receive the word of his mouth and teach your daughters wailing and everyone her neighbor lamentation. For death is come up into our windows. It is entered into our palaces to cut off the children from without and the young men from the streets. Speak, thus says Jehovah. 
The dead bodies of men shall fall as dung upon the open field, and as a handful after the harvestman, and none shall gather them. So, verse 19 is a death song of the people. Now, verses 20 and 21 is a death song of God. God gives them his own words of lamentation. Verse 20, God tells these lamenting women to learn a new song of lamentation and they're to teach others. Let these professional women teach their daughters who's gonna, who are going to follow them in the trade. In verse 21, the song says that death has entered by the windows and gone into the palaces. This is actually God's way of mimicking the religious system they observed, which brought about the judgment. In one of the legends of the god Baal, he was planning to build a palace that would have no windows whatsoever. He was talked into allowing one window to be built in this palace of Baal. And later in this legend, another god named Mot, M-O-T, which means the god of death, entered through this window into Baal's palace and slew him. Later, Baal was resurrected and other things took place in religious worship. So this is part of the religious and legend of Baal, religion and legend, legend of Baal. Now in a satire of the very religion they observe, in verse 21, new words of lamentation are given. Death has indeed entered through the windows. However, Death has not entered to slay Baal, but to slay them. Death cuts off children from within. Death cuts off the young men in the streets without. Concerning their bodies in verse 22, dead bodies will fall everywhere on the open field. No one would gather up the corpses. And so they'd be like dung lying in the fields. The carcasses of the people are going to remain exposed. And we're going to see a contrast here between Jehovah and the false gods. From, uh, verse, from chapter 9, verse 23, down to chapter 10, verse 25. Now, in verses 23 to 24 of chapter 9, we have the only grounds for boasting. Thus says Jehovah, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glories glory in this, that he has understanding and knows me that I am Jehovah who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says Jehovah. In verse 23, three things which man is not to boast about is his wisdom, his might, or his, or his wealth. None of those three things. Man's wisdom, strength, and wealth meant nothing to God. Now, according to verse 24, what mattered is an understanding and knowledge of who God is, namely that he exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness. And those who truly knew God would follow his example by practicing these things. The word for loving kindness means covenant loyalty. It is a loyal love to the covenant between God and Israel. Justice is to be established perfectly. Justice establishes the rights of men. It also includes the judgment and punishment of the evildoers. The lawbreakers are to be punished. They are to, establish, they are to establish and exercise justice. They are to defend the rights of people and punish the evildoer. They're also to exercise righteousness. They're to live in accordance with the standard. Now, and the standard at that particular time is the Mosaic law. Our standard today is the law of Messiah. The Mosaic law standard included social, legal, ethical, and religious righteousness. One who has a knowledge of God should understand that these are three things that God desires people to boast in. They're not to boast in their wisdom, might, or riches. They're supposed to boast in loving kindness justice, and righteousness. In the warning to the uncircumcision we find in verses 25 to 26. You know, previously, we saw that God delights in righteousness and justice. So now verses 25 to 26 reveal what he planned to do to those who did not practice justice. According to verse 25, such people had uncircumcised hearts. Behold, the days come, says Jehovah, that I will punish all them that are circumcised in their uncircumcision. 
So God will eventually punish the uncircumcision. The emphasis in these verses is upon the uncircumcision of their hearts. In verse 25, he uses the expression, behold, the days are coming. Now, this is the first time that Jeremiah uses this expression. He'll use it a total of 15 times in his book. So 14 more times. This is the expression he generally, perhaps always uses for the prophetic future. In verse 26, he says, Egypt and Judah and Edom and the children of Ammon and Moab and all that have the corners of their hair cut off that dwell in the wilderness. For all the nations are uncircumcised and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in heart. So there's, we're talking about the heart issues here. Now, the list of nations here to, need, uh, to be punished in verses 26 includes Egypt, Judah, Edom, Ammon, and Moab. It also includes those, all those who have the corners of their hair cut off. Now, the phrase here literally translates as an all who are in the farthest corners who dwell in the wilderness. That's what all those who have the corners of their hair cut off means. Now, most likely, the phrase refers to Arab tribes of the east. And, and uh, later on in Jeremiah 25, 23, in Jeremiah 49, 32, we'll see that. Um, now, the reason they did this, uh, cutting off the corners of their hair, they did so in honor of uh, Dion Dionysus, the god of wine. Now, in verse uh, 26, the Arabs had the corners of their hair clipped off. This practice was actually forbidden to the Jews under the Mosaic law in Leviticus 19, verse 27, and Leviticus 21, verse 5. These nations that he lists practice to a lesser or greater degree physical circumcision. At one point during their history, they did practice physical circumcision, and at other points, they did not practice. So at least a class of their society did practice physical circumcision. Now, Judah, she generally practiced circumcision in accordance with Mosaic law. Now, while all these groups may have practiced physical circumcision for one reason or another, the Gentile nations of Egypt, Edom, Ammon, and Moab have remained uncircumcised in their hearts. Now, Judah is also part of that list. Judah had degenerated to the same level as the others. Judah was no more circumcised spiritually than the others were. Back in chapter 4, verse 4, Jeremiah had established that an uncircumcised heart is a heart that does not understand spiritual truth. Now, because the whole house of Israel is uncircumcised in heart, the judgment must now come. Here we have, uh, we have uh, God and idolatry compared in verses 1 to 16, chapter 10. We have a, a satire here and idolatry in verses 1 to 5. Hear ye the word which Jehovah speaks unto you, O house of Israel. Thus says Jehovah, learn not the way of the nations and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the nations are dismayed at them. Now, two points are made in verses one to two. First, God issues an admonition to Israel not to learn the ways of the nations. The ways of the nations is idolatry. Second, they're not to be dismayed at the signs of heavens. They were not to be concerned with the predictions of astrology and uh, all the other occult practices. They're not to be dismayed at the astrological and occult worship. While these things dismay the Gentiles, they should not dismay the Jews. For the cust verse, three, verse 3 to 5. For the customs of the peoples are vanity. For one cuts a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. They're like a palm tree of turned wood and speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither is it in them to do good. So the satire begins in verses three to five. In verse three, what he's saying is, a man goes out and he cuts a tree from the forest the man is the one who swings the axe, cuts the tree down. It's the man who cuts it down. It is the man who brings a tree. 
In verse 4, from this tree that has been cut down by the axe of this man, it is now decorated, you know, silver and gold to improve its appearance, make it look nice. It must be fastened down with nails. Why? So it doesn't fall over, it doesn't move. <laughs> so, so this is their idols we're talking about here. So the idol doesn't topple over. The final product in verse 5 is like a palm tree of turned wood. Actually, uh, this could be translated like a, like a scarecrow in a cucumber plot, a cucumber field. It can't speak. It is nothing to fear. And this little scarecrow in the cucumber patch cannot do you evil or good. It's a, this is a satirical picture of a man cutting down this tree, decorating it with silver and gold to make it look better. And suddenly it becomes his God. And he begins to worship the very thing that, that he made with his hands. And, you know, he worships it, worships it as though it could actually do him evil or it could do him good. The man cut the tree down. He decorated it. The man has already cut out the life of the tree by cutting it down. It's now dead. Now in the satire of Jeremiah, he followed a previous prophet who enjoyed a satirizing idolatry. Isaiah, Isaiah in three, in three different times satir, satirized idolatry. Isaiah 41, verse 7. Isaiah 41, verse 7. Isaiah 44, verse 9 to 20. And Isaiah, Isaiah 44, 9 to 20. And Isaiah 46, verses 5 to 7. And this is where we're going to leave it for this session. Thank you for coming along. Study hard, grow strong.